So hey, if you have your Bibles, um, if you would go ahead and uh, open to Matthew chapter 14. We'll look at verse 22 to 33 today. So uh, um, as we are kind of walking through this journey, we're in like the fourth week of walking through a series that's called Meet Jesus, Discovering the Nature of God. And so, because if you wanna know, wanna know God, you have to know Jesus, because Jesus represents who God is. That's the assumption we're making, which is true from the scriptures. So as we're going through this week by week, what happens is just what happened 2,000 years ago, you and I will have an assumption about how we understand the way God works, and then Jesus shows up, and many times, he challenges the assumptions that we have. He did it 2,000 years ago. That's why the religious establishment got so upset with Jesus, because he didn't fit into their box of what they thought God should be. And sadly, 2,000 years later, we still struggle with the same thing. We create, sometimes we create Jesus in our own image, or we come up with what we call a theology, which is our belief of what's true about God. And we form a theology that we think is airtight, it's perfect, until Jesus interrupts our lives, and we don't have a category for that. We don't have a theology for that. And today when we look at this story, this is one of those moments where our theology, our understanding of God, kind of gets shaken up a bit. Because it doesn't fit with what we want God to be like. He always goes outside the box that we paint for him. And so we're going to look at a story that's probably familiar to you. It's a story of a storm and what happens in the middle of the storm. And the reason this is so important is because it changes the way you and I understand the way God works in our life. Because the normal narrative of the way we understand God is this. If life is good, then God is good. If life is bad, then there is no God. That's the way we work. Now, you, know, you wouldn't articulate that. You wouldn't say that, but that's the way we function because we ask and we pray and we want things to go a certain way and they don't go that way, so then we get mad at God, we get disillusioned with God, and then we reject him altogether. Why? Because God hasn't come through the way he's supposed to. So in that equation, who's God? We are. We are. We're telling the God of the universe how he's supposed to run the world, how he's supposed to be, what his nature's supposed to be like. We get it kind of reversed. So in this story today, we're gonna to learn that there's something the opposite of what happens, and this is what's important, and I have seen this in my life. When I used to read this story we're gonna read when I was a kid, I didn't understand it. And as I got older, I understood a little more, but now, now that I've had some experience in following Jesus, now I understand what was really going on in this story. Because the core of the story we're gonna read about doesn't really have to do with the storm. It doesn't really have to do with all of the circumstances. What it has to do with is one primary thing that happens out of the storm, which happens out of every storm, if you and I will pay attention. Jesus wants intimacy with us. And one of the primary avenues that you experience intimacy, which is defined this way, to fully know God and to be fully known by him is when life is not easy, when things are a struggle, when you and I experience pain or suffering or difficulties or storms. That's when intimacy gets built. And many times we want intimacy without struggle. We want to just hand it to us. We want to be really deeply connected to God, but we don't want to go through any struggles or pain. So just put it in the context when you were a child. So if, here's a story from my childhood. So I love lightning and thunder, and I wish in Southern California we got a whole lot more, but we don't. So every once in a while, you know, when you get those rare moments where you have that, as a kid, I was so excited. And I remember one night I went to bed, and it was really active. It was like, I think it was about 12 or 1 in the morning, and you could just hear the, in the, the distance, you could hear the rumble, you could see the flash outside. So I opened my blinds in my room. I'm watching this storm and just loving it. And I could hear the storm coming closer and closer. You know, as a kid, you know, you, you see the flash and you start counting, you know, to see how close it is when the sound catches up to the light, all that. And then out of nowhere, bam! I mean, the loudest sound I had ever heard in my entire life. And I went from enjoying the moment to freaking out. I jumped out of my bed and I bolted into my parents' room and I dove right into their bed. And I was shaking. And of course, immediately they woke up and you know, they were like obviously consoling me. And what had happened, it wasn't just that a, light, a bolt of lightning hit close to our house. It hit a transformer in the neighbors next or behind us in their yard and it exploded. So it was the sound of, of a bolt of lightning hitting a transformer and then boom, it, exploded. it shook our house. And I was scared to death. But in that moment, something happened between me and my parents. I realized they were a safe place. That's why I ran to them, because I knew that if I could get into their room, even though the world around me may be falling apart, at least mom and dad were there, and they were safe. What's getting built there is a sense of intimacy, which is built in trust. That they would be there when things were difficult. They wouldn't somehow magically make all the difficulties go away, 
but they would be consistently present in the midst of the difficulties. I want us to understand that today because in the passage we're going to look at in a moment, you and I need to understand what Jesus is getting at, not only in the lives of the disciples 2,000 years, what he's getting at in our lives, what we need to understand about who he is, what it really means to meet Jesus. So as we've been doing through, through this series, I'm going to ask you just to pause with me. We're going to, I'm going to pray because we are making a very important assumption. Jesus is here. His spirit is speaking out of his word today, and he has something for every single person here that he wants us to hear. We just need to open our ears and soften our hearts to receive what he has. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we read this story about your journey with your early followers, would you, as Lord, we know you faithfully do, would you speak clearly to us today? Would you help us? Our ears where they're closed up, would you open them? Lord, where our eyes are blinded to your truth, would you allow them to see where our hearts have been hardened? Would you allow them to be softened so that we today can experience something from you that changes our perspective of you and changes the way we live our life? In Jesus' name, amen. So let me read here in, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33. It says this, Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, this is Jesus, of course, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was long way, a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, and they said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear, but immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come, on, uh, come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, and he walked on the water, and he came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And being, uh, beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. So in this encounter that Jesus has with his disciples, there's a bond that's beginning to be built in them. It's a, it's a part of intimacy and connection with Jesus that they hadn't experienced before, but now they're beginning to experience. And in this, this story of this storm, and Jesus being the God of storms in our life, I think there's six things I want to highlight that I think are true out of this that help us to experience intimacy with Jesus, which is the ultimate goal, to be in deep relationship with Jesus, to know the God of the universe as he knows us. So the first thing is this, if you and I are gonna experience that level of intimacy with Jesus, then we have to learn, first of all, to move forward. This is really important. So in verse 26, it says this of Jesus. He made the disciples get into the boat. He didn't tell them, he didn't ask them, he made them, why? If you rewind a little bit to what had just happened is they had just witnessed Jesus feeding 5,000 people. Well, actually 5,000 men but, and families, which means closer to 15 to 20,000 people Jesus fed with just hardly enough to feed one person. So they just experienced this incredible miracle that's just unfolded before them. And so for them, they're like, this is good. Let's kind of keep this thing going, right? This is, this is amazing. What other tricks are you gonna do, Jesus? What other miracles are you gonna perform? And Jesus doesn't just keep on a roll here. He stops and he sends them on their way. Can you imagine? And I'm sure there was a little tension like, wait, things are really starting to roll, Jesus. Why are you sending us off and going off by yourself? Let's just keep this going. What they were experiencing was, was, was a good thing, but they were getting stuck in a really good moment be, and they were gonna miss the next moment because they wanted to hang out in this one. And boy, is this true of us today. One of the reasons I'm convinced that we really don't know Jesus as we're supposed to is because something happens in our life and we hang out in that moment and we never move beyond it and we settle for living our life through the lens of the past. We're always in that moment, like if you've heard yourself say, man, those were the good old days. When you follow Jesus, there are no such thing as good old days. There's just the days that God's working in now and what he's gonna do in the future. If you and I think that the greatest thing that God has ever done is in our past, then we're in trouble. Yes. We're stuck. And we get stuck in that, and sometimes we're stuck in models, we get stuck in kind of rituals and things of what church is supposed to be. Those were the good old days when we sang hymns, right? Those were the good old days when church services were this or that or when worship was this or whatever. And we have, we, oh, those were the good old days as though God is not actively working today. We haven't moved forward. I will never forget at my, at my prom in, in high school, a uh, number of us, after, after prom was over, we went down and 
I went up to the top of the Bonaventure Hotel in, uh, in, in LA just to hang out. Of course, you know, dinner there is like $5,000 and drinks are like $100. So we all ordered water and sat there and looked at the lights, right? There's like, I think, eight or 10 of us. And so we were there for like an hour or two. And then we were leaving. We got into the elevator to go down. And the, the, these ladies got in with us. And they were probably in their late 50s, early 60s. And they were looking at us. And they were like, oh, look at these sweet kids. You know, we're all dressed up and everything. And then one of them said this, and I'll never forget this. She says to me as, you know, a 50 or 60 some year old woman, she says, enjoy this. She goes, because this is the best season of your life. And at first I was like, oh, this is really cool. And then I thought for a moment, I thought, oh my gosh. <laughs> this is as good as it's gonna get. Water at the Bonaventure after my prom, right? <laughs> No, but I'm thinking in my mind, this poor woman in her life has been living the last four or five decades going back to her high school years saying that was the best it was going to get for her. And how many times do we do that with Jesus? Oh man, it was so good when. When you and I do that, we don't really know Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't stay stationary. He's always moving forward. He's always doing something more and something new. And that's how you know you're connected with him when he moves you forward. Like his disciples, he made them get in the boat because he knew what he was leading them into. He knew what was next in their life, which leads to the second thing. Intimacy with Jesus comes when we embrace struggle. So he sends them out, and you get to verse 23 to 25, and this is what's crazy. So he sends them out in, into the boat. They're out in the sea, and the storm kicks up, and by the time Jesus gets to the scene of what's happening on, nine hours have gone by. They have been in a storm for nine hours, and estimates were that in those nine hours, they had gotten themselves a whopping three to four miles. That's ridiculous. That's like no progress at all. And so they are struggling. They are trying to figure out how do we get through this storm? How do we survive? How do we move forward? And they're stuck there because they're in this midst of this struggle. And believe it or not, struggle is a part of the way God works in our life. Now, here, here's the thing you and I have to understand, that the, the storm that they're in the middle of is, is, is something that Jesus knew he was pushing them into. So this storm's not caused by the devil. It's not caused by human error. It's not caused by human sin. It's caused by who? God himself, which, by the way, that really tweaks our theology. God creates a scenario in my life where I have to struggle. God pushes me into difficult places where I have to struggle. Yes, he does. Because he knows our human nature. He knows that we're not going to experience what he has for us unless we go through some kind of pressure in our life. That's the way it works. So in this situation, they're struggling. They're pushing hard. And this is something that's laced throughout the Bible. That with pain and struggle and suffering comes what? Growth and transformation and change. Listen to what James writes in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. This is in the message, which is a paraphrase. He says, Consider it a sheer gift, my friends, when tests and challenges come at you from all sides. Do you really consider them a gift when life is difficult? He goes on, you know that under pressure, your, your faith life is forced into the open and shows its true colors. So don't try to get out of anything prematurely. Let it do its work so that you become mature and well-developed, not deficient in any way. See, you and I, I have to understand this. This is what God was, I'm convinced of this because we know the end of the story. The disciples hadn't experienced persecution yet. They hadn't really felt the weight of what it meant to follow Jesus yet. So Jesus was not only sending them the storm to build intimacy, he was sending them into the storm because he knew it was next. He knew that those 12 that were on the boat, 11 out of 12 would actually lose their lives directly because of him. He knew what kind of pressure they would be under. So he was giving them a little bit of heat until there was a whole lot of heat down the road. He was building for the future. And so many times the struggle that you and I are going through is not necessarily about a resolve at the end of the struggle we're going through right now. It's because God is testing something in us to help us to have strength for the future to pursue you through other things. That's how you become stronger. You know you've gone through something and you know that that doesn't mean that, oh great, this is hard, now the next thing is gonna be harder. No, God does something deep inside of you so that you don't look at how difficult it is because you realize he's with you. There's always, always this preparation element of struggle that God is working in our lives to do something in us. And if we don't submit ourselves to it, if we pull out of it, we will never experience what God has for us. We will never be strong enough to move forward where God is at work until we stay faithful in the midst of the storm. 
When I started playing basketball in high school in my 10th grade year, uh, because of schedule, I wasn't able to make all the conditioning I was supposed to. And I remember trying to, I knew conditioning was important, but, but my high school coach, because we didn't have the talent that other schools had, conditioning was the ultimate thing for him. He wanted our team to be in better shape than every team we played all year long. I didn't understand that in 10th grade until my 11th grade year when schedule worked out and I could be present at all the conditioning, then the light went on for me. Because this is what he said. He goes, we're, I remember we get to school early. We would stay after school late. We would do, we wouldn't, in fact, for the first three months, we wouldn't even touch a basketball. I'm like, this is basketball, right? This is not weight training and running and, you know, throwing up because you're sick. And it's, I mean, it was tough. But then this is what he said. He goes, this is not about now. He goes, this is about in the season when we get into the fourth quarter and we're playing a team that is far more talented than us, but we're better conditioned than they are. And no matter how good conditioned they are, if we're better than they are, even in their talent, they won't be able to stay with us. And I remember that unfolding and watching as we got into the fourth quarter of games and teams could not keep up with us. They're taller, they're faster, they can jump higher, yet they ran out of gas at the end of the third quarter. And I realized all the pain of preseason conditioning had everything to do with what we would hit when we were in the fourth quarter when we really needed that conditioning to kick in. There's a fourth quarter in all of our lives that God has for us that you don't know when that time's gonna come, but it's gonna come. And if you have pulled yourself out of the pressure and the pain and the struggle of things firmer in your life, you won't have the stamina to get through what God is doing in your life. You'll miss it. We're never supposed to pull out because Jesus is always present in our lives, which leads to the third thing. This is another one that will tweak our theology. Intimacy with Jesus comes when we experience fear. How many of you want to admit you run from fear? Okay, most of us do. The rest of us are lying, but the, all the honest ones just raise their hands. <laughs> no, there is a reality. There is phobic and counterphobic, and some people, they actually are navigating their fear by running at it, and they look really brave. I wish I was one of those people. I am not. My wife, she is. I am not. But we all experience fear, and we have to be honest with that. But part of experiencing fear is what God builds in our lives. So what's going on? It's, it actually says it in verse 26. They were terrified. Here's what's crazy. They're terrified by the storm because they think they're gonna, gonna die. Then Jesus shows up, and then their fear goes through the roof because they think he's a ghost. Okay, now we have a storm and a ghost. This is crazy. They were absolutely in, in fear out of their minds. That's right where Jesus wanted them to be, in fear. You're like, well, well wait a second. I, I don't want to be in fear. I want to be courageous. I want to be brave. No, but courage and bravery only come when someone's experiencing fear. The absence of fear is not courage and bravery. It's when there is fear and you find a way to, to push through because you know that God is at work in your life. That's what that means. So for us to understand this, to, to really embrace our fear, that's how intimacy gets built. When you and I move through our fear for the, what Jesus has for us is relationship. Here's the thing. If you know the God of the storm, you can make it through the storm. If you don't know the God of the storm, it's just a storm. And there's no hope. But if you know the author of the storm, guess what? You know he's in control, even if it seems overwhelming, even if your boat is sinking, even if the waves are too big, you know who's in charge of all of this, and he's got you. So I had a good friend a number of years ago who's a police officer. He's actually a canine officer, and I went on a number of ride-alongs. And I just, I love law enforcement. I have a high respect for what you do if you're in, in law enforcement. But, but we would go on ride-alongs, and I just would marvel at his ability as an officer, and then also with a dog on top of that, and a dog that would, you know, bite your arm off if you gave him a shot. And I went on a number of ride-alongs, and the dog was always in the back, and I watched the dog get amped up. And just a really, really good friend of mine. And so one of the things we were talking about on one of the ride-alongs is that he, he said, you know, I've always really, like, wanted to, like, fly, and even talked about learning how to be a, become a pilot and things. And I said, well, funny you should say that. My brother-in-law is a pilot. He goes, seriously? I said, yeah, we should go flying someday. And when I said that, I could tell the conversation changed slightly. I was like, wasn't quite sure where it went. And so I said, let, let, me, let me talk to my brother-in-law and see if we can get set something. He's like, oh, okay. So I got my brother-in-law and I gave him a call. He goes, yeah, he goes, yeah. He goes, here's, here's a time we could do this. It would be great. And so I called my friend and said, hey, we're going to go flying on this day. Are you available? He's like, yeah, I think so. I'm like, this is just a strange, you know. So, so the day came and we showed up and uh, we get there and the, here's this guy that I like, like have respect for. He's just a police officer and everything. And he gets out of the car and he's like almost shaking. And I'm like, what is wrong with him? And so we walk up to the plane, which was a four-seater. It's a small little plane. And then he really started freaking out. 
And I said, man, well, what is wrong with you? He goes, I'm afraid to fly. I'm like, you want to become a pilot and you're afraid to fly. I don't know how, those work, how it works. So we're standing there, and, and many of you, some of you have met my brother-in-law, Curtis. He is one of the best pilots, and I'm not just bragging on him because he's my brother-in-law, but also because his temperament. He's, he's one of the most calming people that I know. When you talk to him, he just brings the level down. So before we got on the plane, my brother-in-law, he knows what's going on. He's flown a ton of people, and he's seen anxiety before. So he just starts walking through all of what he does pre-flight, walking around the plane, checking the plane, explaining everything to my friend, telling him all about it. And you could tell in that 15 minutes before we ever got on the plane, you could feel the anxiety levels just going down, just dropping. Now, there was still some anxiety when we got into the plane. <laughs> But then when we took off, Kurt's explaining everything. All of what's going on in the instruments, all what's going on with the tower, with the radio, everything. He's explaining everything to him. He's explaining him the physics of flying and really how hard it is you have to try to crash a plane. It's really, really hard to do that. And so by the time we got to the end of that hour-long flight, almost all of his anxiety was gone. And I'll tell you why. It wasn't necessarily because he got this great explanation about the physics of flying and how everything has worked. It's because I watched him, because I sat in the back seat, and I watched Kurt fly, and I watched him sit next to him. He started to trust my brother-in-law. He started to trust Kurt. So that any time Kurt said something, you could tell he was hanging on every word. But he trusted him. And what eased his anxiety was the relationship, not the information. He trusted what was coming out of Kurt's mouth. He trusted Kurt as he saw Kurt maneuver the plane around the sky. He trusted him enough that eventually he did step forward and he did start to take flying lessons on his own. But it started with him freaking out when he was gonna fly the first time. You see, you and I have to understand about the storm in our life, the difficulties we go through. It builds trust in Jesus that you can't have apart from that. That means when you're in the middle of a storm, guess who's gonna show up? Jesus is. Because he's wanting you to understand something. He's wanting you to understand he's trustworthy. He's present. And that's what the disciples are having to come to grips with. At first they think it's a ghost. Then they realize it's Jesus. And now they realize he's also in the middle of the storm. He's not somehow absent from it. Which leads to the fourth thing. Goes a little bit deeper. Intimacy with Jesus also comes when we take risks. So anybody who ever's told you following Jesus is easy it's comfortable, it doesn't require anything of you, Has probably selling you something that you shouldn't buy. Because following Jesus is one of the hardest things you'll ever do. Because it requires something of you. It doesn't require anything of you to be saved, it requires you something of you to grow and develop and experience intimacy with Jesus. So in verses 28 and 29, Peter does what nobody else will do. You know, we cap on Peter, but remember, Peter's the only one of the 12 who got out of the boat. He's the only one that took a risk. Everybody else was too afraid. So he, and I love what he says to Jesus. He says, Jesus, if it's you, he says, tell me, command me, tell me to come out of the boat. And Jesus says, come on out, Peter. And so Peter steps out. He takes a risk. Now, Peter had no guarantees, but he had enough trust in Jesus to say, I'm gonna try to do what Jesus is doing. I'm gonna try to walk on water. And so he steps out and he takes a risk. If you read beyond this point throughout, this, to, especially in the Gospels, and you read the relationship between Jesus and Peter, Peter had a special bond with Jesus because Peter was always the first one in and the first one to fail, but he's always the one that was trying to pursue Jesus, trying to do the right thing, trying to get connected to Jesus, and that's the beauty of his journey. He fails miserably, but if you go to John chapter 21, which is, by the way, the last message in this series, that God is a God of restoration. And Peter thought he lost everything, but he gained everything. That's Peter's relationship. What He was the one willing to take a risk. That is part of following Jesus. You don't have guarantees. You just have faith. And sometimes faith seems a little shaky, but it requires risk. So Old Testament story, 1 Samuel chapter 13. So Saul is the king of Israel, not doing such a great job. But his son his son, Jonathan, has a different idea of who God is and believes that God can bring victory over the Philistines. Well, Saul is underneath the pomegranate tree with his army shaken in his boots. And what does Jonathan do? Jonathan does something absolutely crazy. He says to his armor bearer, the only guy he can get to go with him, he says, let's go over to those Philistines, those uncircumcised folks, and basically said, let's pick a fight. And let's see if God shows up. And what does his armor bearer say? 
Whatever you say, Jonathan, let's go. And they go. And in the first engagement, they take out 20 Philistines, just the two of them. And by the way, between the two of them, they had one sword. Not a great military strategist, Jonathan. But then the result is what? The battle starts going with two guys against all the Philistines, and then the Israel, Israel's armies wakes up, up, wakes up and goes, oh, there's a battle, we should go join it. And God ends up, what, giving Israel victory that day. Why? Because one person, one person was willing to risk everything to see if God was in the battle. What if you're the one person? No, not what if, we are the one person. And God is waiting for us to take the risk. Why? Because intimacy is built when we have faith to take risks, and then God shows up and does things beyond what we could possibly imagine. And here's the good news. If you risk and die, you gain. We have that. It's, it's ironclad. It's what Paul said. If I die, I gain. So even if Jesus says, okay, yeah, you get in the battle, you're going to die, but you're going to see me on the other side of death, and you'll have no more suffering or pain, but you'll be in my presence. So it's a win-win situation when we take risks with Jesus, which leads to the fifth thing. We experience intimacy with Jesus when ultimately we face doubt. So what does Jesus say to Peter when he puts his hand out as Peter starts to sink? Because he starts seeing the waves and the wind and he's all, now he's really like, okay, now I've got myself in the deep end here. Jesus says, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Here's one of the realities of following Jesus. All of us doubt. All of us do. Anybody who ever tells you they don't doubt God doesn't really know God. Because doubt is part of the process of us becoming closer to Jesus. Peter, when in the middle of his doubt, Jesus didn't say, oh, sorry, Peter, you're doubting. I'm going to let you drown. What does he do? He puts his hand out and says, oh, man, you almost had it. You almost had it, but, but you doubted but I'm still going to save your life, even though you doubted. God is not intimidated by doubt. He's not like, oh my gosh, they're doubting now. What are we going to do? He never, there's never been a day where Jesus has ever said that about us and about our life. Because doubt is part of the process that God uses to build something in us. There's a story in Mark chapter 9 about a father who comes in faith to Jesus, whose son is demon-possessed, and he can't fix him. He can't cast out the demon. He's done everything he can to try to help his son, and he cannot get freedom for his son. But in the midst of his belief in Jesus, there's also this doubt. Could he really do this? Could he really bring freedom for my son? And let me read the story in, in Mark chapter 9, verses 21 to 24. Again, this is in the paraphrase called the message. It says, he asked the boy's father, Jesus, how long has this been going on? Ever since he was a little boy, many times it pitches him into fire or the river to do away with him. If you can do anything, do it. Have a heart and help us. Jesus says, if, there are no ifs among believers, anything can happen. No sooner were the words out of his mouth than the father cried, then I believe Help me with my doubts. Your doubts show up in the storm. Your doubts show up in the middle of what? A broken relationship, a failing marriage, a cancer diagnosis, a lost job. That's where your doubts show up. Why, why do doubts show up there? Because we still have this idea that for God to be God, life has to be perfect. Life can have no problems, otherwise he's not God. God, I've been praying. God, I've asked, and you didn't come through, so you're no longer God. No, no. In the middle of the doubt is when you and I get to know who we really are and who we really think God is. See, because it exposes our bad theology about God. God is not good when life is good. God is always good. Amen. And when we believe that, even in the midst of our doubt, guess what will happen? Just like he reached down and puts his hand out for Peter, God reaches into our circumstance. He may not take your cancer away. He may not give you the dream job. Your marriage may end. But one thing Jesus promises, he will never leave and he will never forsake us, even in our lowest and darkest moment. He will never do that. He guarantees his presence. That's why he came to earth. That's why his name is Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. He won't leave us. He won't forsake us. So finally, the final thing in this passage that I want us to see in verse 33 is intimacy with Jesus comes when we ultimately admit dependence. It says in verse 33, those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. 
So they went from almost arguing with Jesus to get in the boat, like, no, 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 let's stay here, this is really good, to being in the middle of the storm for nine hours, struggling, thinking they're gonna die, to Jesus showing up and freaking them out like because he thinks he's a ghost, to Peter stepping out on the water, all of this transpiring, and what is the end of the story, at least at this point? They worshiped him. What is worship? Well, it's interesting, the word, the Greek word used in this context, which is the, the normal Greek word used throughout the New Testament, is the word proskuneo, which means basically to prostrate yourself, to bow down, to become totally dependent on somebody else. That's what worship is. And what they were doing is, it wasn't just like, okay, let's, Peter, you got a good song we could sing to Jesus now that he's on the boat with us? That's not what they were doing. They were literally bowing down. They were worshiping him. They were admitting their dependence on him because they were in the middle of a storm, in over their head. They couldn't save themselves. Jesus comes up and he saves them. And so now what? They're completely dependent on him. That's what worship is. I want us to think about, do we struggle with worship? So the outflow of worship is what we do on Sunday morning. When we sing songs and we raise our hands, that is not worship. That is evidence that there's something in us that wants to worship that admits that we are dependent on God. And if you come up on a Sunday morning and you struggle with worship, it's because something during the week has not transpired. If you haven't been dependent on God all week, you're not gonna worship him on Sunday. And maybe it's because those moments where you haven't, what, what the outcome of the storm for you is anger and bitterness and frustration and you think that God hasn't treated you fairly. When God's waiting for us, he's waiting for you to be dependent on him because in the dependence, is where God does his best work. He doesn't work with people who are prideful. He, what is he, actually, God, the Bible actually says what? God opposes the pride or the proud. Why? Because you can't work with a proud person because they think they have all the answers. And that's when we get it reversed. What we tell God what to do, which means we play the role of God. But what if there's something else about being dependent on God that is a breakthrough moment for you? That leads to, no, I, you know, I don't like to raise my hands. I don't like to sing. Well, maybe th that's not ultimately the goal of worship. The goal of worship is for God to get your heart. And if he gets your heart, he'll get your mouth and your hands too. But part of it is there's something that has to break in us that as I go through my week, when I reach, reach those pinch points and those struggles and those storms, that my first call is out to Jesus in the middle of the storm and my dependence is on him. God, if you don't show up, I'm sunk. I can't do it. And in that moment, what? Worship happens. Worship happens, or it becomes that dependence. So what I'd like to do just in the next few moments, I'm gonna ask you in a moment to, to close your eyes, but before, before I do that, I'm just gonna give you some context. I think one of the things that's important as we, we walk to kind of the, the conclusion of the message, but, but just understanding that this, this storm that Jesus has created for his disciples, which by the way still happens for us today, is that we need to take time to reflect on those moments in our life where we maybe have interpreted that God wasn't present, but actually, he's been very present. So let me just, side note, before I have you close your eyes and just walk through some questions. One of the things that it's interesting, the, the more you know, science and even psychology advances, the more it discovers the truth of what is true about God in the world. And one of the things that's happened in, in counseling over the last decade or so, maybe even longer, is that when people experience a moment of brokenness, maybe even a moment of abuse or tragedy in their life, there's always this assumption, and this, this gets attached to this thing called trauma, that God was not there. He abandoned me in that moment, he left me, and so that becomes the driving force in somebody's life in that moment of trauma, is they disconnected from God because they were convinced he wasn't there. So their life now becomes about being disconnected from God destructive behavior, addictions, all those kind of things can kind of come out of those moments. In counseling, what's started to happen is biblical counselors who are trained in script, the scriptures and in psychology will do things to help people to go back to the moment of their trauma, what they experienced. And I've had a number of friends who've gone through this who experienced abuse as children, and in a moment of counseling, that counselor helps them go back in their mind to the moment where they thought God had left them. And in that moment, they discover that even though they were being abused or they had lost a loved one or a tragedy happened, in that moment, something happens and they realize Jesus was actually there. He was right in the presence of it. They're like, well, why didn't he stop it? Because God allows humanity 
to do things like start wars in Ukraine because God has allowed humanity what, to make our own choices, even at the detriment of other people. But what does Jesus promise? I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. So I've watched my friends' lives be dramatically transformed because they realize they've been living the last 20 years of their life with this idea that when life gets bad, God is gone. And then what happens is they realize he's never been gone. He's always been present in my life. And then that means everything moving forward from that moment. Tragedy does not mean that God is absent. It means that God is present and at work in some aspect of my life. So would you go ahead and close your eyes? I'm gonna go just through a series of questions and not every question is going to apply to you. But I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna pause after each one of them. I'm gonna let you kind of process through if that's you, because I think they all tie into what God wants to develop in each one of us through storms, and that is intimacy with him. The first question is this. When was the last time you wrestled with God over your life? What I mean by that was when was the last time something was made you uneasy because you thought you had God figured out, but something has entered into your life that you don't have a category for. And because of that, you're, you're trying to wrestle with God because you're not quite sure if you understand and because what you thought you understood now doesn't seem to make sense. See, that's the detention the disciples lived in, by the way. When Jesus said, let's move on from the feeding of the 5,000, they're like, wait, wait, we don't have a category for this. Let's just stay here. Have you been experiencing wrestling with God? Because here's the good news. You're wrestling with God. He's wrestling with you. He's present in your life. He's making you feel discomfort. He's working out you being unsettled in your life because he's going towards something deeper in you. Maybe it's, that's, maybe that's not you, but maybe the second question applies to you. When was the last time you embraced struggle instead of running from it? Just think about that for a moment. When's the last big battle in your life? When's the last big trauma or difficulty in your life? And think in your life, did you turn in and run from every place there would be pain? Did you eject from a relationship because it was painful? Did you walk away from a situation because you felt it was too hard? Jesus was right there and he wanted to meet you there. He wanted to meet you in that struggle because he has something he wants to perfect in you. And he was there. He was there at that struggle. He was there at that difficulty. He was there in that pain. He was there in that suffering. And he's saying to you today, it's still undone. But it doesn't have to remain undone. As you walk back into that pain or that struggle, Jesus is there to work in your life. Third question, when was the last time you felt Jesus in your walk with him? When was the last time you felt his presence, that you knew he was there with you? When was the last time that you really were convinced that Jesus is with you? If it's been too long, it's because you're stuck in a moment and you won't move forward. It's because you run from the pain that Jesus was in the middle of and he wants to perfect something in you. And he's saying today, I am here today. And I want you to feel my presence in your life, in your struggle. The next question is this. When was the last time you stepped out of what was easy or comfortable and took a risk in following Jesus? When was the last time that you stepped into something that you ran over your head in that was related to something you know that maybe God was doing in your life? When was the last time you risked everything for him? Maybe for some, it was last week or last month or last year. For others, it's been a long time. In fact, maybe for some, the last risk you really knew you took for Jesus that was the moment you said yes to him in your life because you knew what it would cost you. And you experienced some struggle and you experienced some pushback from people, but something in you settled for comfort, settled for what was easy. You stopped risking. And because of that, you, you know that you, 
you felt like you reached a certain level with Jesus, but you, you stopped. You reached a line that you hadn't crossed yet. And because of that, you don't feel connected with Jesus today. Jesus is saying, if you're willing to give everything and risk everything, I will meet you right in the middle of that risk. A couple more questions. When was the last time that you surrounded yourself with something that seemed impossible and in the middle of that you experienced doubt? When you're facing something that just, in our human understanding, there's just no way this could happen. There's just no way that there could be breakthrough. There's just no, nothing that could really change. And because of that, doubt started to creep into your mind. And maybe one of two things happened. Maybe the doubt drove you away from Jesus, but maybe the doubt for some of you is a point of shame. I mean, you're a follower of Jesus. You've known Jesus mo maybe most of your life, and, and your experience is that I, I can't have doubt. I, I can't believe that. I can't, I can't give in to that, because if I give in to that, all of my world will fall apart. And Jesus wants you to know right now, he knows you doubt and he still loves you, and he won't run from you. In fact, in the middle of your doubt is where he will show up. He will reach down in the middle of your storm and he will pluck you out of the water. He will, like Thomas, he will show you the nail prints in his hand and the, the spear pierce in his side so that you will know he is God even in the middle of your doubt. And then finally there's this. When was the last time you finally came to grips with your own humanity and weakness and had to rely on God's power and strength alone? When was the last time that you gave everything, you laid everything down and you admitted for what was true and what God knows true is that you cannot do this thing called life. You can't be a good parent, a good husband, a good wife, a good employee, a good person. You can't do it. You can try, you can succeed for a short amount of time, but you find yourself in failure again. And God is saying today, I will meet you in the midst of your failure when you will admit you need me. Lord Jesus, I pray right now for every person here, every person who is watching online, wherever it is that we have felt you are not with us, right now, Jesus, would you reveal yourself to be present? And Lord, if we are going through overwhelming circumstances and struggles today, would you, just like you did for your disciples 2,000 years ago, would you come walking on the water of our storm? And in the midst of that, would you help us to realize you want us to know you more and more and more. And there's more of you that you want us to know that we haven't gotten there yet. And so, Lord, today I pray that we would be people who truly know you. We know your nature. We know your heart. We know what you're up to because we experience intimacy with you today. So Lord, I pray, pray also from this point forward as you reveal yourself to us that Lord, what happens tomorrow, next week, next month? Because Lord, we're gonna go through storms again, but I pray that what we're experiencing now in this moment of being reminded that you're always with us, that we will have the faith that whatever comes our way, we will be convinced, God, you're in the middle of this. You're never gonna leave. You're never gonna forsake. You will always hold us palm of your hand. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence in us. In your name, amen.